All right, so the next couple of topics uh, are on ELD, electronic logging devices. And uh, in a bit here, I'm going to bring up uh, Heather and Middle Luke to help me uh, because they actually do the work uh, at our office where we uh, get our expertise uh, in talking about this is uh, ELDs has really changed our business model uh, and we've seen it coming for a number of years and have been involved uh, gosh way back in 2009 uh, consulting with a company that was building an ELD on, a, on the smartphone platform and uh, uh, actually uh, even spent a week in Thailand talking to a group of programmers about uh, what the hours of service rules are about and try to explain sleeper birth rule to them it was a, quite a challenge uh, when they didn't even realize uh, that there is daylight savings time. So. Uh, the, the whole programming thing has been coming about uh, for, for years and uh, uh, we have uh, researched and uh, the clients that uh, we've worked with trying to get them into the right solution. Uh, there are 160 plus different ELDs out there today. Uh, many of them are uh, startup companies and uh, won't be around. Uh, probably a year from now. If you're bought into one of those, uh, you could be uh, in, in needing to search for a new, a new solution, but we'll maybe talk about that in a minute. So uh, we've researched, uh, we uh, uh, have uh, recommended different solutions depending on the type of operation, and it's really something that needs to go into the decision for which ELD that you use. And uh, so we've researched uh, and you know, as far as one that we uh, refer and resell is Geotab uh, because it fits most of our smaller clients needs and uh, but not all. Uh, so uh, the right solution uh, takes some some asking questions and finding out really what you want to do with it and what are what's the type of operation that you have. So. So our, we've, uh, especially in the last, since the mandate happened on December 18th, had Luke has uh, probably answered a, a thousand phone calls, if not a thousand and one, along with uh, Heather. So they're gonna kind of get, uh, help me out here a little bit. So as far as where have we been with ELDs, as far as regulatory wise, uh, the phase one is over. It uh, was over on December 18th. So. Uh, that was an awareness and transition. So phase, we're into phase two now, which basically is if you need an, uh, if, if your drivers need to do a driver log, uh, you need to, it needs to be done either with an AOBRD, onboard automatic recording device, or an ELD. The AOBRD device is the old version. Um, uh, rule that's been uh, it's been published out there for a number of years now the ELD is the new set of criteria so the FMCSA allowed folks that ha that that spent money on the AOBRD not to uh, lose out on that money and be forced to switch to an ELD they they are allowing this phase two where you can use it for another two years to get your money's worth out of it but then you have to switch to the ELD and we saw a whole rush of folks saying, okay, the AOBRD has, is less res, you know, has many less restrictions in it than, than the ELD does, so we are going to go out and buy an AOBRD before the time period. And uh, uh, basically kicking the can down the road for a couple of years, hoping that maybe the rule will go away. Uh, and uh, so now it's, it's trying to figure out, uh, we've got companies out there that have some trucks with AOBRDs and some trucks, the newer trucks have to have ELDs because you cannot, at least after December 18th, you cannot put a, 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 if you add a truck to your fleet and you have an AOBRD, you have to uh, outfit it with an ELD. So now you've got two systems to try to manage and uh, it, it's really uh, problematic. So we're in phase two. Phase three obviously is in two years when the AOBRDs are no longer allowed and uh, it will be ELDs. 
So uh, obviously it's heavily debated. Uh, the industry is split on ELDs. Uh, you've got uh, very pro uh, ELD uh, companies and then you've got the other side, uh, usually the smaller companies that hate ELDs. And uh, so because the industry is split, uh, we couldn't get consensus. And so the rules passed. So the FMCSA, if you've kept up with the trade magazines, are processing exemptions and uh, like crazy. Uh, there is uh, companies like livestock haulers were granted a 90-day ELD extension. Rental trucks was uh, exempt. Uh, if you're going to rent a truck eight days or less, they're exempt from having an ELD. But if it's a short-term rental over eight days, but less than 90 days, they've delayed it for 90 days. The cement haulers, uh, cement carriers, were just granted, I think, an exemption for the 30-minute break rule. And uh, the PeopleNet, uh, users of PeopleNet were granted a 90-day extension. So it just goes on and on, and it's going to continue as all these different types of operations uh, uh, well, what about this? What about that? That the FMCSA didn't think about. We need an exemption. We need a delay. And you think about, okay, the poor enforcement folks. Okay, oh, is this an AOBRD or is this an ELD? Is this an exemption? Is it not an exemption? And, and so there's a lot of um, uh, difficulty out there with, uh, with, with ELDs. The rules have not changed just on how to record the rules. So there's lots of uh, exemptions. Uh, where are we in enforcement? And right now we're in a soft enforcement where the feds uh, and most all states have adopted that you're, we're, you're not going to, you're going, they're going to cite not having an ELD or an AOBRD, but it's going to be cited under rule, a, a rule they made up for just tracking. It's not going to assign any points, CSA points. It's not going to put the driver out of service. It's merely you're going to be cited. And the cite citation number you should make a note of, 395.22A. If you receive an inspection that has that uh, rule number associated with it, it is no points, the driver's not placed out of service. And it's only for this interim period until April 1st, when that rule, that, that, lo that part number goes away and it's gonna get replaced by whatever the other, 395.8, and which is CSA points, which is an out of service violation. CSA points I think are seven plus, because it's an out of service, they add another three points to it, so it's 10, and then you multiply it by three because it's time sensitive. So it's, you don't want a 395.8 violation. So if you, in your violation notice that you receive in this April, till up until April 1st, for not having a ELD, make sure it's 395.22 because it, it is a citation that allows the FMCSA to track how good, bad things are out there, but uh, there is no uh, points, and that's what you want. So after April 1st, uh, Interstate will be uh, enforcing it uh, full, full tilt. May, some states are for intrastate, uh, such as Oregon, and they are considering, uh, you know, they have adopted the ELDs, but for intrastate, they may consider uh, postponing the full enforcement beyond April 1st. So for example, the state of Oregon for intrastate is considering maybe not fully enforcing it until October. They're, they're taking comments right now, they're listening to public, uh, you know, to the public comments that uh, John, I think, mentioned, and uh, they'll be making a rulemaking here within another month as to what they're going to do. But that only affects intrastate. So if you're interstate, uh, April 1st. What's happening at roadside? I don't want to get too much into this because I know Joe Darby from the OTA uh, is going to be talking about uh, kind of uh, more in depth on roadside. But uh, 
the hours of service from the ELD perspective, it's all about the, the, the primary inspection method is supposed to be transmit the data. And the data is not transmitted to the guy that's stopped you at roadside and asking for it. The, the transmission goes to an FMCSA portal. And that portal goes to a software that was created by the FMCSA called ERODS. And uh, we do have uh, somebody from the FMCSA coming uh, uh, late, a little later to talk about what that EROD software does and what it looks like, what the report looks like. So it generates this, uh, it goes through that software, it decrypts all of the ELD data is encrypted, so you can't just send it to anybody. It's got to go through the software to decrypt it, and then it will list possible violations in a report. Then the roadside officer has to go up and get that report and pull it back down and look at the possible violations and look at the logs and so failure in a data transmission uh, or at the direction of the enforcement officer, you know, is either a printout of the log or a display that can be passed uh, to an enforcement officer. He can be, uh, without getting into the truck, the officers will not be getting into the truck, but they need to be able to see that <coughs> display uh, from standing on the side rail or whatever. So uh, that is still, that's kind of the backup plan uh, that uh, the FMCSA put into place is uh, to be able to display it. So obviously uh, there's a lot of inspection complexities involved with all of this. We kind of mentioned them, you know, that you know, the officers are having to, you know, is this an AOBRD, is an ELD, it's transmitting the data, it's getting the reports from the FMCSA, is all of that working? If it doesn't work, what are, you know, are we looking at the display? Is there a printout? Is this an exemption? Uh, lots of complexities going out there. And, and of course, you know, the drivers on the road, we've got to get them moving. We can't be spending all of this time trying to track all of this down. So, you know, what is going to be, you know, what is happening? What these officers are, are you know, are going to be falling back to what they know, uh, you know, when there are complexities that, uh, come up, which is going to be, you know, show me the screen. You know, they probably prefer a printout, but I don't think many carriers are going to put in printers in their trucks. They're going to have spot check questions uh, available to them to you know, at least, you know, if I'm going to ask these questions, if I get the right answers to these questions, I have got a pretty good idea that you know what you're doing with the ELD and those spot questions are going to be you know things that are in the rules like uh, show me your supply that's supposed to be in the truck of paper logs you should have a book of them and that's by rule and it, you're supposed to have them in the truck in case your eld breaks you can go back and do paper you're supposed to have a set of instructions for your eld in the truck and they're if you can't show it to them it's a violation uh, they're going to really test the driver's knowledge on you know, the, you know, what do they know about the ELD? How many hours do you have left in your day? You know, how many hours do you have left in your week? Are you on the 70 uh, hour? Uh, you know, are you on the eight day or the seven day? And, you know, if the driver can't, if it can answer those questions, there's probably a pretty good feel for, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, obviously there is an ELD, keep on moving. If they, if they fail in any of those, then it's like, okay, let's, let's take a closer look. So. So just some real quick uh, tips for drivers on the driver's side, you know, know your ELD system, have the manuals, have paper backup logs available. Realize that most enforcement may be learning from you about your ELD system. Again, there's 160 different ELDs out there. One thing that we found that maybe Luke will talk about is ELDs are very precise. So if you have a 30 minute break and you take 29 minutes and 45 seconds and you start driving, you have a violation. Obviously with a paper log in 15 minute increments, you could take 29 minutes and the log you're within the 15 minutes and you know, you can, you can make that look fine. But in an ELD, it is very precise. If, if it's a 30 minute break, it's 30 minutes. Cause once you start driving in an ELD, 
using an ELD, as soon as you hit five miles an hour, it is going to record you in the driving mode automatically. And driving cannot be edited. You can't go back and change it. All right, so what's next? Uh, full enforcement, April 1st. Talked about that. Expect more exemption requests to the M FMCSA as more and more and more folks uh, uh, want their particular operation looked at. And what about me? I need this. Uh, I think the FMCSA is going to have to deal with a multitude of exemption requests. I think as the FMCSA looks at each one of those, there's going to be guidance given that's going to come down from the FMCSA. Has everybody looked at the FMCSA, FMCSRs, the regulations, the, the, the big green book with all of the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations in it? Uh, if you get the, the big version, it also has the guidance in it. If you go on the website, there's a section that has the guidance. You can learn as much about the rules through reading the guidance as you can the actual rule. Rules are typically in legalese. But the guidance is somebody asking a question, what about this? And the FMCSA answers that. So uh, expect more of that type of written guidance regarding ELDs coming. Expect shippers, brokers, insurance companies to enforce carrier ELD compliance. Everything, uh, I'm, I'm reading more and more and more about uh, the sh you know, <coughs> shippers and brokers and insurance companies, you know, uh, Okay, ELDs are the law of the land. And if I'm going to insure you, you're going to have to certify to me that you are uh, using an ELD. Or if I, you are going to ship my product, or if you're going to uh, uh, work on a construction project uh, for me as, or as Oregon State, uh, you're going to have to be following the rules, the, the ELD rules, and you're gonna have to certify that. So I think uh, as far as, in, Enforcing the use of ELDs is going to come from industry because uh, those that pay the bills are going to require it. Expect ELD market consolidation. Uh, again, I mentioned it several times. There's 160 different units out there. Uh, they're not all going to survive. Uh, everybody was chasing, trying to get their market share prior to the, the, the mandate taking effect on December 18th, those that uh, didn't sell enough units to support all of the, the software and the engineering and things that go behind the scenes, they are going to uh, not be around. And if you happen to be a carrier that, uh, that purchased one of those, uh, you're going to have to repurchase uh, somebody that, that has stuck around, so or was able to make it. So they're definitely going to be uh, uh, consolidation. You need to prepare for ongoing ELD training. This, this training involved, uh, and Luke and Heather will talk about it here in a, in a bit, but the, the training involved not only at the driver level, but at the support level, even management level, about properly using uh, and getting the most out of ELDs is quite, uh, quite a process, and there's a lot to it. And as you have turnover, you're going to have to address it over and over and over again to make sure that uh, it is incorporated into everything that you do within your operation. And something, expect driver coercion filings. You know, prior to them, prior to the FMCSA adopting uh, the ELD mandate, they had to address driver coercion. The OIDA sued the FMCSA and the court found that they didn't take into consideration driver coercion, people using ELDs to force the driver to, uh, to, to do things uh, that uh, were not legal. So the FMCSA, and actually I got this question, uh, we got this question the other day that, well, the FMCSA has no power over a shipper or a broker or a receiver making a driver uh, break the hours of service rules, but that is incorrect. Uh, as of a couple of years ago, they have a driver coercion rule where there is penalties for somebody to coerce a driver to break the hours of service rules. So if I'm a carrier, I say to a driver, well, you're going to deliver that, role, that load or I'm not going to pay you. That is coercion and you can be 
fined and penalized for that. If I am a, we had a call the other day from an owner operator sitting in a yard for six hours waiting to get loaded and uh, ran out of hours. Went out into the parking lot of the, uh, uh, the shipper and uh, get, trying to get his 10 hours. Got into his 10 hours and pounding on the door. He said, you gotta move your truck. You cannot park here. Well, as soon as he puts it into drive, the ELD records it as driving. It cannot be edited. It interrupts the 10 hours and now he's in violation. So, you know, is that driver coercion? Well, he was coerced. He either, he's either moves the truck or has it towed. Could that company, that shipper be reported? It could, and I think we're gonna see more and more and more of that. The FMCSA will come back and say, okay, yes, it is legal, but we don't have the manpower to track all of this down and, and do all of that. But uh, uh, there, there is a method to, uh, for some of this detention and uh, coercing drivers to break the hours of service rules. So expect more of that. All right, so we're gonna move into the actually fine tuning the ELD and this is where I'm gonna bring up Middle Luke and Heather. Uh, they actually do this on a daily basis and answer many of the phone calls. I guess I need to stay over here with the camera, but uh, so uh, to kind of set this up, you know, I guess what we have learned is that, you know, the ELD, again, the whole focus has been on the driver and that, that we need to teach the driver how to use the ELD, which is definitely a, a big focus because they have to interact with that software. And, uh, but there is the support personnel the internal controls, as I like to call them, that needs to be in place and the support people using that system because the ELD produces data and that data needs to be dealt with on the back end. So there's a whole training uh, things. I mean, a lot of you who have ELDs and have, I'm sure experiencing all of the, the, uh, the back end things that has to be done with this stuff. So, and then of course management you know, with the ownership and making the decisions, you know, there's many, you gotta establish your users and who's gonna have login rights to the systems and uh, you know, each user being unique and you know, can they read only or is it a supervisor, the admin, I mean, who is gonna have access to, to your data, who needs to have access to your data within your organization. So. There is a lot of management uh, thought that has to go into it before you actually turn on the ELD system. And uh, so, so we'll start getting into the, the details of what are some of the things that you've got to do. And this is what kind of Luke, you've been helping get our databases set up. So uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks David. So uh, as Dave touched on earlier, each user can be unique. So each driver that you set up in your ELD system could have totally different settings, um, user to user. So it's really important to go through this checklist and, and see, you know, which HOS rule set are you using? Are you using the, you know, eight day, seven day hour or the short ball or something like that? Make sure that each user is configured correctly uh, for the right rule set that you're using for your company. Uh, again, personal conveyance, we talked about that a little bit today. Uh, that's something that most ELDs will let you configure to the user. Are you gonna allow this user to use that as an exception? Uh, if so, um, you can also limit how many miles they drive under that rule. So if you want to keep them from going more than 20 miles under that rule, you can set that and configure that um, depending on your deal you provide. Uh, yard mode, uh, again, is this something where in your rule set you want to enable so that they can move across the yard using on-duty time versus drive time? Uh, again, that will be more under the actual rules and regulations, but that is an option. Uh, make sure you configure your time zone. Time zone is really important. Um, if the driver is based out of you know the Midwest and you're on the West Coast, uh, they need to be set to the time zone that is in their home terminal, not to yours. Um, that'll be confusing and will cause issues uh, later on you can see for the roadside inspections. Um, miles versus kilometers. Uh, if this one is not maybe correctly, you'll get lots of questions like, why do I have half the miles or double the miles I'm supposed to? Um, check these settings. Again, 
it, there's a minor difference between miles and kilometers. Um, also, gallons versus liters, same thing. Um, you want to configure that. A big, big, big deal is the driver's CDL number needs to be entered under that user, um, as well as their state that their uh, CDL is under. Uh, a lot of the systems that transmit the data, the EROD stuff, if it's not in there, I know some ELDs won't transmit at all, and that will cause a problem there. So make sure that you go through your users that are CDL holders, and that they have that in there as well. Home terminal, um, I kind of talked about that. Make sure their address is set to whatever home terminal they're out of. Uh, it's really important to have that set correctly because that will show up during the roadside inspections as well. And lastly, exemptions, um, short haul, stuff like that. Make sure you have that configured correctly as well. Um, most of these setup processes, at least for, for Glowstone, we handle this for you. Um, but certainly, again, when you go home, check with your, your ELD folks, make sure it's all set up to be correctly configured so you have a smooth transition. So um, after after you begin your setup process, the um, internal training is going to be super important as well. Dave mentioned it already. You need to make sure that management is on board as well as your support and your drivers. All of those are equally important in the management process to make sure that your system is running um, efficiently and you're getting everything out of the ELD that you possibly can. So if management has a clear understanding of what the capabilities of the ELD are, the data that is um, being captured in the ELD and how to use it, it will be able to um, make it easier for the organization to trickle that down to all of the other users involved. Um, Luke was mentioning setup process, and so that's one part of the support team. But in addition to that, you have your dispatchers, you have the people needing to make edits, um, you have people answering questions, and then the, the folks in your organization that also need to train for any kind of overturn that you have in, in your organization. So making sure that you have a really, really good support plan in place and designated people to take on these different um, levels of training will be important to make sure that everybody is successful. Having somebody available to train new drivers as well as having them available to um, teach the drivers where they're making errors and issues. Um, that arise. So anybody who um, isn't able to, they forget to log themselves off, for example, or they forgot to change the record of duty status. If you don't have somebody in place to support those changes and help the driver, they're going to just continuously be out of hours. So making sure that you have somebody designated is really important. And then the driver perspective. Dave talk, talked about this already. Um, the drivers are ones that are out there on roadside that are going to be asked all of these questions. If you um, don't have a good training system in place for your drivers and are supporting them, they're going to be the ones that are stuck at roadside, um, not able to explain to an officer how their system works, not able to furnish to the officer what needs to um, be furnished to him, such as transferring over the data or how many hours he has left. If that happens, it's going to delay your loads. That's going to cause problems within your organization because drivers are going to be stuck roadside with the inability to do that. So having somebody that they can rely on, somebody that they can talk to, who they can call in the event that they just don't quite get it. Um, with that being said, if you are not managing this throughout your organization, then maybe some of these issues won't be addressed until it is roadside. So if you have somebody who is managing your system, checking to make sure that logs have been verified, making sure that drivers are, um, are using their um, exemptions correctly, um, making sure that everybody is selecting a unit before they actually get on the road so that they don't have a bunch of unverified logs or unassigned logs. All of those pieces are crucial within your guys' organization to make sure that everything continues to run smooth. Um, Dave has mentioned it. I'm sure a lot of our other speakers today are going to mention it. Um, education to these drivers and your personnel is going to be key. And it's going to take everybody involved in each one of these pieces to do that. So when you're talking about each one of these, um, just making sure that you guys sit back in your, in your company and say, okay, who's going to train all of our new drivers? Who's going to be the one to run our reports? Who's going to be the one to address the issues that are coming up in our reports with our drivers and making sure that you have a plan in place to capture each one of those so that way your personnel and your drivers are not lost um, in the event that an issue does arise. Can you put me over to the next one, Luke? So um, some of those issues that come up are um, back office log edits. Uh, Luke has taken numerous amounts of phone calls on drivers simply just forgetting to select their vehicle, 
um, drivers forgetting or not understanding that they needed to change the record of duty status over, they're out of hours. Having a dedicated staff um, or team member is going to be important to make sure that your drivers aren't stuck without their hours. Um, shop involvement for unassigned logs, making sure that those get to the proper drivers so you don't have any hours of service violations going on. Um, from a shop perspective as well, um, you can use this uh, in, in just managing the fleet perspective from a, a maintenance angle, um, allowing for them to use this system to help them manage that and make sure that everything roadside again mechanically goes um, well. And then um, ensuring that drivers authorize their logs, making sure at the end of the day they're saying, yep, these are my logs, this is all correct, and accepting those so that way it finalizes their logs at the end of the day. So again, education, um, train, 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 make sure your drivers know what they're talking about roadside and that they have a clear understanding of how the ELD works and then provide them a support system in the event that they need some extra training. I just wanted to, uh, you know, follow up, you know, th there is a regulation uh, where a company is responsible for monitoring the hours of service for its drivers, typically, typically called log auditing. Nothing in the ELD mandate says that log auditing goes away. Uh, log auditing is supposed to continue. Uh, it should be easier with an ELD because the violations are reported much easier than trying to go through all the graph grids and determine who, is, uh, who has a violation. But that process of going through and looking at the logs, because ELDs, you know, you reach your, uh, you know, your 11th hour, your 14th hour, your truck just doesn't shut off. I mean, the driver can keep on driving and, and violate, but log auditing uh, and the, the, the follow through up with uh, those uh, inspections uh, needs to continue. And the, the FMCSA would be expecting you to, for the drivers that are violating, is to do the teaching and training and the progressive discipline to make sure that it happens. So log auditing does not go away. Uh, so just, you know, support staff. I mean, again, we've uh, touched on it already, you know, Mac to how to maximize the ELD, you know, the getting your dispatcher, making sure that before the load is uh, dispatched, that the dispatcher is sending them out with enough time to get there. Uh, and obviously no coercion whatsoever. Uh, getting your sales team, you know, involved, you know, detention time is much easier uh, to prove with an ELD. So uh, there's going to be a learning curve for shippers and receivers that they need to work with uh, carriers to make sure uh, that trucks get in, they get out, uh, and those that don't need to be educated, need to be uh, different fees, uh, set up uh, to ad address those detention and, and detention time is very very easily tracked with an ELD and uh, one thing the uh, tax department involvement uh, if your tax department and your uh, your IFTA you know IFTA allows off-road miles to you know you've got your taxable miles and you got your total miles your total miles of every mile the truck drives your taxable miles are those miles that are on highway. Uh, under old methods of paper record keeping, it's very, 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 very difficult for a driver to say, okay, I'm on road now, I'm off road now, and this was my odometer on road, this is my uh, off road miles. And off road is, is your terminal, uh, private property. So, I mean, if you are, uh, uh, you have a, a large, yard or well maybe we'll just pick on a garbage company when they go to the recycler as soon as they enter the recycling company's yard they are on off-road and uh, those miles have to be tracked for IFTA purposes but they're not taxed and with an electronic record keeping you can set up geofencing and again easily prove and take advantage of, of the tax savings that you will get uh, again it depends on your operation what's uh, how much uh, the truck travels uh, you know even to the shipper once they reach the shipper uh, it's 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 not taxable if you're a construction and you're building uh, a new lane on the freeway that freeway is 
is a job site and that is considered off-road and not taxable. So and, and under old non-electronic, that is very, very difficult to keep track of. But with electronics, you just simply draw a geofence around it from the back end, from your support personnel, and then it will track every time that truck goes in and out, how much time it spends in there, and you can take advantage of that. And uh, uh, so that is uh, definitely something uh, that can save you some money. And the same with the Oregon uh, weight uh, mileage. If you're off-road, uh, you know, that those miles aren't, aren't taxed, so uh, you can keep track. I think that's... That's it. So anyway, that's uh, kind of, a, uh, again, a, a, a quick uh, overview of some of the ELD things that, uh, that we, are, we are seeing uh, in these first few weeks. It's, there's a lot, uh, you know, we're hearing of a lot of buyer remorse. Uh, I bought the wrong unit or I bought a unit and they haven't shipped it to me yet because they're way behind. Uh, I can't get anybody from support on the line to tell me what's going on, to tell me how to do this, or the only thing I can reach is a video, and they just keep referring me back to this video. Well, I've got a question. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on, and uh, I mean, we've seen people bring in a box of, here is this ELD, I can't get it to work, can you show, show me how it works? Well, we really can't. Uh, I mean, we can try to help you figure it out, but. They'll just drop it and say, here, give me one that, you can, that somebody can help me with it. So we're, 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 there's going to be some uh, turnover within the ELD uh, people switching to something that they can find uh, and make work. So, yes? Um, do you have any additional information regarding personal commands and adverse condition um, exception? Basically, when um, personal conveyance, I've read that they're looking to change the um, that yeah. rule to be able to use it while your while trucks are loaded. And specifically in the East Coast, we know that parking is terrible. So, like a trucker gets to a truck stop and he's trying to find a safe place to park, but that's full. So, is he allowed to use personal conveyance to find safe? parking for him and then also too if there's a bad accident for adverse conditions how does that get logged does he just keep driving and then he note on there hey I use the adverse condition exception well, let's tackle personal conveyance first and uh, uh, I, I know that personal conveyance is probably one of the keys that enforcement will be looking for to make sure it's used correctly because it's going to be very very easy to use it incorrectly uh, so uh, there is judgment allowed with personal conveyance uh, in that judgment uh, and I think even with uh, adverse driving so personal conveyance is you cannot further your load. You can't further the delivery. You can't say, you know, I'm going to just drive down the road another three miles under personal conveyance, but it gets me closer to the, the destination. It's really to be used for, uh, okay, I've stopped for the day. I need to go get something to eat. I need to go to the hotel. Uh, and it needs to be in a relatively short, distance but if you're you, yeah when you were saying that driver had to move from that they were kicking him out could he have used personal conveyance he was not on duty could he have used personal conveyance to go find a safe place to park? I would say not it would not meet the rule to for personal conveyance he would you know the recommendation I would have is he needs to annotate it I was forced to move because they kicked me out and uh, so the officer, and again, we've, we will, uh, Rob is back in the back, so he can jump in if, if, if I'm off base. Uh, but uh, annotation is going to come into play a lot for especially uh, weather conditions, because uh, there is no push the button and I'm now in adverse condition. It is, you need to annotate. And adverse driving conditions need to be unexpected. 
Like, like an accident, correct. So, so you've got an accident. Right. Right, but if you've, you know, okay, I've got a delivery on the other side of Mount Hood and there's a, well, I know there's a storm coming in and I'm gonna send my truck out over the mountain. No, that's, predictable. that's predictable and that no. you cannot take. So it, there's a lot of discretion in there, but an accident, a landslide, those types of things would be weather. So personal conveyance, you got more on that? Uh, right. Adverse driving. Okay. But, so for the adverse driving, again, uh, primarily my experience is through GeoTab, because that's our system. Um, I know GeoTab does have a button under the options so for adverse driving conditions. You could push that button and then it gives them that additional time. Um, because even if you annotate in the logs, it won't necessarily give you that drive time and show the violation or not. So um, I imagine that's probably the same for most ELDs. There's some sort of option where you push adverse driving conditions and that'll give them that additional drive time. So sorry to. That's right. No. Game, but yeah, from, from our experience at least, that's, that's one provider for ELD. You can just push the button um, and that'll give you that additional time. But the, the thing that they're looking at for personal conveyance is to amend the rule. Right now, uh, the rule says you need to be unladen to be uh, to have personal conveyance. Uh, but they're amending it to be you can be laden because if you're having to be unladen, you know any box truck could never take personal conveyance because you, you can't unload the the truck. It's, their thought was, well, most guys will just drop the trailer and, 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 and go, so they used unladen. So now they're, you know, they're taking comments, it hasn't been passed, but they're taking comments about allowing laden, you know, you don't unhook the trailer, or you've got a box truck that's full and you need personal conveyance to go to the hotel or to wherever, yes, you'll be allowed to, to, to do that. But, uh, I mean, I got one story from, uh, that I heard is that uh, the Cascade Locks, uh, the driver was on personal conveyance and where are you headed? Well, I'm headed to Spokane because there's a great steak restaurant there and I'm under personal conveyance. So, you know, that, that, uh, that, 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 that doesn't work. Um, I get that, you know, within reason. Right. You know, specifically I'm looking at when my drivers have had a long day and they can't find trucks out in the east. Right. They get full right. quickly. Rob uh, summarized is uh, that they're, they're trying to better define personal conveyance because it is vague out there and it is subject to uh, such things as, you know, what is a short distance? Uh, you know, I, again, from Cascade Locks to Spokane, that's not a short distance, but if you're way out in the middle of Wyoming somewhere where there isn't a, a town within miles, you know, that might be a longer distance uh, for, for that to get to the hotel. Uh, so. Uh, we expect more guidance uh, because, again, I think that's an area that uh, uh, is with the ELD is can be easily, you know, I've only got two more hours and, or another hour until I'm home. I'm just going to go to personal conveyance. You know, that's not what it's supposed to be about. And uh, that is a violation. So personal conveyance is a, is a tough one, but it sounds like uh, we're making some progress.